Good morning, everyone. It's good to welcome you to our service this morning. If you're visiting with us, we do extend a warm welcome to you as we worship God together. If you're tuning in later on on YouTube, we thank you for doing so. And we trust that whether here this morning or watching or listening later, you know the Lord's blessing as we worship God together. Let me just draw your attention uh, to uh, just a few of our announcements uh, for us this week, mostly relating to uh, Easter, Easter week, Holy Week, which is next week. And we have our Easter Good News uh, Club on Thursday the 6th of April uh, for primary school children here in Downshire Road, jointly with Ryan's. But any children, any child is welcome to come along to that. And then our Good Friday Communion service on Friday, Good Friday the 7th of April here in Downshire Road. And then if you're brave and willing, the, the, the Presbytery Dawn service uh, on Easter Sunday at 6.30 a.m. at the Big Stone in Kilbrony Forest Park, followed by breakfast in Ross Trevor Presbyterian Church Hall. Our Easter service is half 11 here in the morning and 7 o'clock in Ryan's on Easter Sunday evening. And then we're hoping to have a holiday Bible club uh, in the last week in June in the evening time. Uh, and if anyone wishes to help with that, uh, please speak to me as soon as possible, because we will need volunteers from the congregation uh, to ensure uh, that uh, can take place. So uh, these are the announcements. Let us uh, worship God. We read together in the words of Psalm uh, 89. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround them. O Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. We join together as we sing to God's praise the words of hymn number 204. Hymn number 204, God we praise you, God we bless you, God we name you, Sovereign Lord.
Well, let us pray. Almighty God, we praise and bless you. We proclaim you, sovereign God, the mighty King whom angels worship. We sing of your greatness because the heavens declare your wonder and the skies proclaim the work of your hands. We praise you, our God, for who is like you, the Lord, among the heavenly beings. You are more awesome than all who surround you, and in the council of the holy ones you are to be greatly feared. Everlasting God, we praise and bless you and proclaim you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, majestic Trinity, God, our eternal hope and salvation. We praise you, our God, because you gave the Son of God, given the name Jesus, and called the Christ. And we praise you, our God, for in Jesus Christ you have loved us. And by the cross of Christ, sin is defeated, hell confronted, heaven opened, and sinners justified by grace. Our God, we praise you because through Jesus Christ you have been merciful to us, not giving us that which we deserve, which is judgment for our sin. And we praise you because through Jesus Christ you have been gracious to us, giving to us that which we do not deserve, your Son for our salvation. Holy God, you are perfect, pure and righteous in all things and in all your ways. And you call your people to be holy as you are holy. We confess our sin this day, O God. We confess the shame and sorrow of falling short of all you command us to be and to do. We confess the idolatry of our hearts and the waywardness of our lives, whereby we disobey what you have commanded. We confess our sometimes lukewarm love for you and our lukewarm commitment to Jesus Christ, his cause and his people in the world. Our God, have mercy and forgive us our sin. Cleanse us from our sin by the blood of Jesus and grant us the assurance of sin forgiven as your word promises. And by your spirit renew our lives that we might walk in the joy of that salvation in Jesus in delightful obedience and commitment to him and his ways. Our God and Father in Jesus Christ, you richly bless us in him with that salvation which is full and free. You richly bless our lives each day with an abundance of good things, with many blessings. Our God, from that abundance we present our offering of gifts and tithes for the advancement of Christ's kingdom, the building of his church, and the help of his people in need across the world. Father, we pray that we have given gladly and generously and ask that you bless what we have given. Our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the freedom to meet together, to worship you, to hear your truth. Our God, grant us your grace. Give us ears to hear your truth, minds and hearts to apply it to our lives, to the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we bring all these our prayers. Amen. Well, let us read uh, from God's Word. We turn uh, to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, verse, uh, page 488 in our Pew Bibles. Nehemiah chapter 4, let us hear the Word of God. Of course, we remember uh, that the building work has just begun uh, to repair and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so at the beginning of chapter 4, we read, when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish it in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble? burned as they are. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? If even a fox climbed up on it, 
he would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who surrounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. Amen. And we thank God. Uh, for his word. Boys and girls, you're coming up to the front and I'll come down to see you. sitting there. Good man. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Are we all well? Did we remember to change the clocks this morning? Yeah. yeah, you did, did you? Or somebody else did it for you? This is George. Anybody know George? Some of you know George, do you? Well, this is George. You can learn all the other names in Sunday school, George, okay? Yeah, I know you. Well, there you go. Brilliant. That's brilliant. You know one. Brilliant. So, so listen, I have a Bible verse that I want to show you this morning. And it is this verse. Who can tell me what this verse is? Somebody tell me what this, Sophie? That is right. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Which book of the Bible is it found in? Somebody tell me which book of the Bible it's found in? Anyone want to give that a go? Anybody want to give it a go? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. It's found in the book of Ecclesiastes. Will we say it together? Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter, Four. verse, 
9. Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament of the Bible. What do you think this verse might mean? What do you think this verse might mean? Okay, well, let's try and figure it out. Well, wait, let's think of, of some examples to help us understand what it might mean. So imagine, if, imagine for, for a moment that I wanted to move the communion table and I wanted to drop it down onto this level. Now, if I was doing it on my own, first of all, do you think I would succeed? I'd get the job done. No. No. It, Corey, do you think I'd get the job done? Do you think it would take me a long time? Yeah. So what, what, if, what if I got some help? What if I got some help? Would that make the job easier? If it, Oh, if it was you, I wouldn't have that much help. I was thinking of maybe Johnny Adams down there. He's a nice, big, strong fella. Or somebody else, you know, he could come up and help me. Do you think we would get the job done more quickly? So is that two is better than one? Yeah, two is better than one. Or what if, what if I was to ask one of you, just one of you, to go around the whole church building, upstairs, don't forget there's upstairs as well, and remove all the Bibles from the pews? Do you, think, do you think it would take you a while to get that done? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, do you think, do you think, you think, and why is he asking me to do that? Why pick on me? But what if I asked all of you to do it? Do you think it would be done more quickly? Yeah? So two or three or four or five or six are better than one. I have in my pocket here a pound coin. Anybody ever seen a pound coin? Yeah. A pound coin, they're, they're, they can be rare sometimes, so they can. So if I was to give this one pound coin to a missionary, do you think that would help that missionary tell others about the Lord Jesus? Wouldn't go very far, sure it wouldn't. No. It doesn't even buy you a bottle of Coke these days, a one pound coin. But what would happen, do you think, if we all gave a pound coin every month to help that missionary tell the others about the Lord Jesus. I think that'd be a better idea. And that would work, wouldn't it? If we all gave you something little to help someone else tell them. So two or three or four or five or ten or twenty or thirty are better than one. So what's the book of the Bible we're reading at the moment? What book in the Bible did we read from a moment ago? Well, no, very good. Yes, that was that verse. But a few moments before you came up to the front, what book was our Bible reading from? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. You were going to check the order of service, Corey, weren't you? Nehemiah. That's right, the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is all about God's people working together to rebuild and repair the walls of Jerusalem. Now, we're not rebuilding and repairing the walls of Jerusalem or any other city like Jerusalem. But God wants to use every single one of us to build a church, to build us strong so that we can tell others about the Lord Jesus and we can help each other live for Him. He wants to use every single one of us to build the church. And I think that's wonderful. So there's something we can all do. And I want to give you a little challenge this week. Okay. I want to give you a little challenge. you up for a challenge this week? Say, yes, Brian. I'm not convinced. Are you up for a challenge? Yes. I'm a wee bit more convinced. So here's the challenge that I want to put before you all. So every, I want you to pray for each other this week, okay? So when you, t when you have that time to pray at home, I want you to remember each other in prayer. And that's one of the ways we build each other up. We pray that God will help us. We pray that we would, we would follow Jesus, that we would learn his words. I want you to pray for each other this week. And that's a simple way we can help each other and God can use us to build a church. Will you do that? Yeah. Will you pray? Now make sure you get all your, everybody's names before you go home today. All right? So you know who you're praying for. Make sure you know that, okay? So, you, so you'll be up for that challenge, are you? Yes? 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 Sort of. Well, I want to challenge you to do that. Will you do that? Well, let's pray, shall we now? Father God, we thank you that your word teaches us a very simple truth, that two 
are better than one because when two people work together, we can do a better job. We can do things more quickly. When three or four or five or six of us work together, we can do a great work together for you. And Father God, we thank you that you want to use every single one of us in the church to build a church so that we are strong in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we can help each other, Father God, to walk with him and to, to show his love to others. And so, Father God, we pray that we will understand that. And I pray for our boys and girls this morning that they will understand that and that you would use them, Father God, even at a young age, to build your church in this place and help them to pray for each other and to encourage one another in the things of you. Father God, we thank you that you have loved us so much. We know that we are special to you, not just because you have loved us, but because you want to use us uh, to build the church in this place. So, our God, hear our prayer, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, your song this morning is, thank you, Lorna, your song this morning is number 210. Number 210, I'm special because God has loved me. And we'll sing it this one through twice, okay? Sunday school. But the summer months provide many opportunities uh, to serve on mission teams across Ireland and across the world. And we think of Scripture Union, CSSM teams, uh, and we think of CEF teams as well. But if you, may, if you were in Ryan's Presbyterian Church last September leaving service, uh, there we heard from a team from the organisation called Exodus, which is based, uh, originally based in Port Stewart in the Coleraine area. Now, two of our young people here in Downshire Road, uh, Lydia and Matthew, are part of summer mission teams uh, with Exodus. So they're going to come up to the pulpit here and share briefly uh, where they are going and what they hope uh, to be doing. Come on ahead.
Good morning, everyone. I have been given a fantastic opportunity to be part of an Exodus Team 24. And um, this summer, between the 20th and 30th of July, myself and four others will work alongside St Andrew's Presbyterian Church in East Belfast. During this week, we will aim to run kids' clubs and serve God within the local community. As a congregation, I ask that you will pray for the team as we prepare for a week of fun, friendship and outreach. I ask that you will pray for the children and young people that we, will be, that we will encounter throughout the week and that God will plant a seed of faith within their hearts. We as a team will be extremely grateful for your support as we aim to make Christ known and evangelise the communities inside East Belfast throughout our week of ministry. Uh, from the 17th to the 27th of July, I'll be heading to Sutar in Romania with Exodus Team 23. Um, Exodus is a Christian organisation involved in mission outreach, mainly in Europe. My team consists of 12 people between the ages of 17 and 19, along with the two leaders, <coughs> Ben and Kirsty. Our role will be to serve in the local community through kids' clubs, practical work and home visits, which may include visits to orphanages and care homes. There will also be other teams joining us from Ireland, Hungary, 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 Latvia, and other parts of Romania. Well, thank you, uh, Lydia and Matthew. And in addition to Lydia and Matthew serving on an Exodus team, there's a member of Ryan's Presbyterian Church also serving on an Exodus team, uh, Johnny Cartmill, and he's uh, going to India. So how can we support these uh, young people? As Lydia said, we can pray uh, for them, and we'll do that uh, in a moment. But each uh, team member is also asked to raise a portion of the total cost uh, of their trip. And anything over and above uh, goes to support the work of Exodus or goes to support the community in which the Exodus team uh, have served. And with that in mind, a coffee morning has been organized for Saturday, the 22nd of April, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon here in Downshire Road. And it is a joint effort with Ryan's to support Lydia, Matthew, and Johnny. And there will be an opportunity for both congregations to support these uh, three young people, and an opportunity for members of both congregations to meet and to mix uh, more informally. So please put that date into your diary. And please remember to pray for Lydia and Matthew and Johnny, and uh, we will have more information, uh, prayer points and stuff uh, nearer, nearer the time. But let's pray, shall we? Our God and Father, we thank you for Exodus and its work of discipling young people in their Christian faith and giving them the opportunity to serve you on mission teams across Ireland and across the world that they will be part of Jesus' vision to go and make disciples in all nations. We thank you, Father, that Lydia and Matthew are part of Exodus teams this summer, and we pray for them as they meet with their team members each week, as they get to know the other team mem members of their teams, and with their teams study your word and prepare for their respective mission experience in East Belfast and Romania. And we do also remember Johnny Cartmill from Ryan's, who is going to India. And we pray, Father, that these experiences will be formative and transformative for Matthew, Lydia, and Johnny in their understanding of you, your truth, their own maturing in and obedience to Jesus Christ, and the strengthening of the hope they have in him. And we pray, Father, they will know much encouragement and prayerful support from us, their church family here in Downshire Road in the weeks that lie ahead. And we look forward to learning more about the work of Exodus uh, when they return from their adventure and their experiences. We thank you, Father, for Exodus, and we thank you for other organizations <clears throat> doing similar work. And we think of Child Evangelism Fellowship and Scripture Union, passionate and training and equipping young people to share the gospel with others and giving them the opportunity to do so. We pray, Father, for your blessing on these organizations in all they do in, ful in the fulfilling of the great commission of Jesus to his disciples. And we pray that through their endeavors, you will add to your son's church those who are being saved in Jesus Christ. Our God, hear our prayer. 
For we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Now we sing again uh, to God's praise, hymn number 492. Hymn number 492, uh, Before the Throne of God Above. There are many stories which never make the news headlines, like the story of a, a lecturer in a theological college in, the, in England that was removed from his position because he dared to tweet uh, his support for the biblical understanding of certain things in society. And that kind of thing is happening on and off in the United Kingdom today. But imagine a lecture from a theological Bible college being removed from his position for daring to uphold the truth of the Bible. When Paul returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch after his first mission journey, he said to the young believers there, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And sometimes those tribulations come in the form of opposition. And knowing the reality of spiritual opposition as we run the race that is set before us helps us avoid becoming too discouraged or drawing the wrong conclusions. As we turn to the fourth chapter of Nehemiah, we discover that no sooner had the work begun, Sambalat and his cronies were not best pleased. And one of Nehemiah's tasks was to help the people of Jerusalem deal with the opposition that they faced. God's people have an enemy who hates to see the advance of God's kingdom and the restoration or strengthening of God's people. There are forces at work in the world today which would love to see the demise of the church and the demise of the witness for Jesus Christ and the gospel. And we need to realize this. 
and accept that it is by many tribulations we enter the kingdom of God. But how does opposition show itself and how do we deal with it? Well, opposition shows itself in order to firstly discourage God's people, to discourage us. We read in verses 1 to 3 of Nehemiah 4 that when Sambalat heard the Jews were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he ridiculed the Jews that he might discourage them. Ridicule is a great form of discouraging someone, isn't it? What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble? Tobiah, one of his cronies, added his own ridicule. What are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stone. And it's clear that the people heard this ridicule because Nehemiah prayed for their insults to be turned back on their own heads. But opposition comes to discourage God's people by ridiculing the work that we do. And I'm sure that when the Jews engaged in the rebuilding and repairing of the walls of Jerusalem heard, uh, heard or heard about this ridicule, they were discouraged and wondered if it, if it was all worth it. I'm reminded of the Lord Jesus, who after his baptism in the Jordan River was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by Satan. And Satan's tactic was to discourage Jesus from the work Jesus came to do by tempting Jesus to follow his path, Satan's path. Or we were thinking at midweek this week about when it might be right to not submit to the governing authorities, that is, to the state. We consider the time recorded in Acts 5 when the apostles were arrested for preaching the gospel and were told to stop preaching the gospel. The apostles answered that they could not stop preaching the gospel because they had to obey God rather than men. And there are many in our society who oppose the gospel and the Christian faith and want to discourage Christians from doing God's work from doing what God commands us to do. And one of the ways they do it is by ridicule and mockery. Sometimes the newsletter newspaper will, will post a, a letter uh, written into the paper on their Facebook feed. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was a letter written uh, by a Christian man uh, de decrying the, the, the state of society, decrying uh, the Sunday football. And when you read through the comments, many of the comments are ridicule and mockery against that Christian man. The times in which we live are not much different to the times in which Nehemiah lived and the times in which the apostles lived. Opposition comes to discourage us, to discourage God's people and the work God calls us to do. But opposition also comes to stop God's work. As the rebuilding of the walls progressed and the gaps in the walls were being closed, we read in verse 7 that Sambala, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod were very angry. Then in verse 8 we read, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. We read in verse 11, uh, in, in the words of Nehemiah, that our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Sometimes opposition comes to stop God's work. Sambalat and his cronies did not want the people of God to succeed. They did not want God to be glorified. They did not want sacrifices to be offered. They did not want the people to honor God. They wanted to put a stop to it. And you know, Satan wanted to stop Jesus in the work Jesus came to do. For Jesus came to crush the head of the serpent. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. And Satan, failing to stop Jesus, turned on his disciples, turned on young believers, through religious opposition and through religious fanatics like Saul, who became Paul. Before Paul proclaimed Christ crucified for sinners, he persecuted Christ and his people. 
determined to stop the spread of the way of Jesus. And history has demonstrated time and time again that opposition comes to stop God's work, to blot out a witness for Jesus Christ and the gospel, whether that was in 16th century Europe through the forces which opposed the Reformation, or 20th century communist nations, or 21st century North Korea, Somalia, or northern Nigeria. And Satan's tactic in 21st century Europe is still to stop God's work, to blot out a witness for Christ and the gospel and the truth of God's word. But his tactic is not outright persecution. His tactic is to infiltrate the church so that the gospel will be watered down. There will be the denial of certain biblical truths. There will be churches conforming to the pattern of this age, not being transformed by the word of God. And we see this happening in, in churches in the UK and the USA and, and many other places. Opposition comes to discourage God's people. Opposition comes to stop God's work. We must not be ignorant of these realities. But how do we deal with it? Well, Nehemiah helps us in three ways. And the first way is we pray. We pray when we are ridiculed for our faith, when others want to stop the work and witness of the church, the temptation is to vent at the opposition, to lose the rag with them. But Nehemiah teaches us to vent our anger, our frustration at God. He teaches us to pray, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Well, that's quite a prayer, isn't it? It's quite an uncomfortable kind of prayer, for it is a prayer for the judgment of God to fall on the enemies of God and of God's people. It is a prayer for God to deal with them. And so reminds us of Romans 12 and 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And the Lord will repay on those who have persecuted his people through the ages. Psalm 98 teaches us that the Lord comes to judge the earth, judge the world in righteousness, and the people with equity. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying for God's judgment to fall on the enemies of God and the enemies of, of God's people, and one day it will. And that will be a terrifying day. But we also remember from Romans 12 and the teaching of Jesus that in our actions toward our enemy, we are to be kind and generous, seek ways to bless but those may be to pray in another way, to pray for their salvation, that they will turn to Christ in repentance and so not fall under the judgment of God. But back to Nehemiah 4, the walls of Jerusalem could not be repaired and rebuilt if there was no prayer for God to restrain and hinder the enemies of God's people. And maybe that's the kind of praying we need for the church today, for the work and witness of God's people in the world. We need to pray for God to hinder and restrain the enemies of God and his people, frustrate their plots and schemes to hinder and stop the work and witness of the church. For we read in verse 15 that God did frustrate the plots of their enemies. The Apostle Paul instructed Timothy in this way, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. Remember, Paul lived under the Roman Empire. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. It is a prayer that those in authority would allow the church to be the church and not interfere. So when we face opposition to ridicule us and stop us in our work and witness for Jesus, God says we are to pray. We are to pray about these things. 
Secondly, we are to build. Sometimes when opposition comes, the temptation is to stop the work. Well, you do some outreach into the community, you get a hard time about it, so you stop. You try to share the gospel with a friend or, or family member, and they throw it back in your face, and you think, well, that's not worth it, I'll stop. But Nehemiah says we are to build. We are to keep at it. And Nehemiah encouraged the people to keep building by reminding them of the Lord, who is the great and awesome judge, and modeling for them prayerful dependence on the Lord. No doubt the people were discouraged because of the opposition, maybe growing weary because the work seems so great, but they were encouraged to build because the Lord frustrated the plots of their enemies. We need to keep before us a biblical vision and understanding of the Lord if we are to build for Him and His glory, if we are to be built up in the hope and promises of the gospel. For it is only in keeping before us a biblical vision and understanding of the Lord to help us we will not fear the enemy, however that comes to us. We need to be children of the God of the Bible, not the God of our own making. And Nehemiah encouraged the people to keep building by reminding them of the Lord, the Lord who still saves sinners, the Lord who is still at work today, even if it is the day of small things. But Nehemiah also encouraged the people to keep building by implementing some practical steps. He posted a guard day and night to meet the threat of the enemy. He posted people behind the lowest points of the walls to watch for the threat. He armed the people. He organized them so they could continue to work and keep be watchful for the threat. So we build, but we don't post guards day and night in the way Nehemiah did. We build, but we watch. Jesus said we are to watch out for false prophets. Paul said we are to watch our lives and our doctrine. We watch, we build, but we also watch. And there's a particular responsibility, I think, on those in leadership or those who have oversight of God's people. We who are elders have a, have a great responsibility, not just to encourage the flock under our care, but to protect the flock under our care. In his letter to Titus, Paul wrote that an overseer must hold firmly to the trustworthy message that is, as it has been taught, so that they can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Elders are called to serve and protect the flock under their care. We must be watchers on the the tower, surveying the landscape so that we are mindful of the enemy and his threats. We build as we remember who the Lord is. We build as we keep watch over our own lives, as we keep watch to protect the flock and ourselves from the enemy, from all that is false and opposed to God. We pray, we build, and thirdly, we fight. We are in a war for the church. We are in a war for the souls of our lives, the lives of our families, the lives of one another. I'm grateful to my parents for many things But there was one rule as I look back for which I am particularly grateful. And it was a simple rule, but a good rule. If you go out on a Saturday night, you get up for church on a Sunday morning. And as I look back on it, maybe they didn't see it this way, but it was a strategy in the battle for the souls of my brother, my sister, and myself to protect us, to guard us from falling away. For if we are not in the place of worship on a Sunday morning, how could we hear God's Word? How could we see God's people? Or I think of a man I know who, when his, when his children went to university across the water, he wrote to the chaplains of each university and said, my, 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 my son, my daughters are at these universities. Look out for them. And, and, he, and he did. He, it was a strategy to protect his children when they went away to university. We don't have time to unpack every part of this, but let me say this. If 
Maybe this is addressed to parents particularly, but also I think to grandparents and uncles and aunts. If we are not influencing our children toward Jesus Christ and toward the fellowship of believers and toward the work and witness of the church, then the world will gladly influence them away from Jesus Christ, the church, and the work and witness of the church. <coughs> If we are not influencing our children toward Christ, the world will gladly, gleefully, rubbing hands together, influence them away from Christ. There's a battle. There is a battle. And we are in a battle not just for our own souls, but not just for the church. We're in a battle for the souls of our children. Are you praying for the salvation of your children? no point praying for them to be rich and famous and wealthy and have nice things. If they're not saved, they're going to hell. Are you praying for the salvation of our children? All of us, not just parents and grandparents, uncles and aunts. Are we praying for their salvation, that they be brought into the kingdom? And if we are to fight, we must arm ourselves for the battle. And here's what we learn from Nehemiah 4. We learn two things. If we are to be armed for the battle, we must always carry our sword. And we must always remember we are part of God's people, the church. Nehemiah armed the people of God so they were always prepared for the fight against their enemies. The Bible teaches us that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Jesus used that sword against Satan in the wilderness temptation. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is the only weapon we have in the battle for the church, for one another, for our families, and for ourselves. Always, we must always carry the sword, the Word of God, the truth of God, on our person and in our hearts and minds. The only way we can be prepared to fight against the enemy is by being armed with the Word of God the sword of the Spirit, that we know it's truth for our lives. It's truth for the world. We must always carry the sword. Whether sometimes people carry a physical Bible with them, the trend today is it's on your phone. But do we always carry the sword with us? Do we know God's Word so that we're ready for the battle? Always carry the sword and always remember you, you belong in Jesus Christ to the people of God. The people in Jerusalem in Nehemiah 4 were in a fight together for their city and for each other. We're in a fight for the church and for each other. In Romans 12, we read that in Jesus Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We cannot fight this battle for the church, for our souls, the souls of our children, the souls of one another on our own. We belong to one another. We carry our sword. We help each other build. We build each other up in prayer and by the Word of God. We encourage one another to stay the course, to keep the faith, to stand firm together in the face of opposition that seeks to discourage us and seeks to stop us in our work and witness for Jesus Christ. Maybe over the winter time, you had a lovely roaring fire in your house and you put on the pieces of coal the pieces of coal glowed brightly and the heat came out and it shone brightly. There was a wonderful warm glow in the room. But what happens when one of those pieces of coal falls out? Well, you lift it up and you take it out and set it to one side. Well, it doesn't shine so brightly. Sure, it doesn't after a time. It doesn't glow so warmly and it gets cool and it grows dim. Well, that's like a picture of the church when we stop coming, 
when we, when we cut ourselves off from God's people. We don't burn so brightly for Jesus when we try to do it on our own. We need to be together. We belong to one another. We help each other build. We build each other up. We encourage one another to stay the course, keep the faith, stand firm together. Well, folks, opposition comes. Let's be sure we are praying, we are building, and we are fighting. Because there's a lot at stake. A lot at stake not just for ourselves, not just for each other, but for our children, for the world. Let us pray. Our God and Father in Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word this day. And we pray, Father, that in the reading and proclamation of your word, we will know its truth for our lives. And we pray, Father, that we will not be oblivious to the reality of opposition, which seeks to ridicule we, your people, and seeks to stop the work and witness for Jesus Christ, to which we are all called. We pray, Father, that we will, in the face of opposition, be people of prayer, be people who are committed to building the church, be people who are armed for the battle by always carrying the sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God in our hearts and on our person. And we pray, Father, that we'll always be prepared to give to anyone who asks the reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, and be prepared to speak your truth in wise and gracious ways when we face opposition for who we are and what we believe. We pray, Father, that we will be unashamed of Jesus, his name and his cause before others. Hear our prayer, for we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Our closing praise, I think, is appropriately hymn number 570, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. <laughs>
to seek and to serve and to follow Christ. And the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day until Christ calls or comes, and then forevermore. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.